Okay, and we are back, ladies and gentlemen, to our last session for this afternoon. Okay, so uh, before we're going to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jo, uh, I would like to acknowledge first our participants who stay with us, participants from Camarina Sur, Batangas, Rizal, Sambuanga, Irigan, Davao, Pampanga, Leyte, Laguna, Isabella, Tarlac, Baguio, Benguet, Bukidnon, Pasay, Gingog, Masbate, Siniluan, Quezon Province, Quirino Province, Agusan del Norte, Cebu, Manila, Digos, Lanao del Norte, Cagayan Valley, Nueva Ecija, and also our participants from Region 1, Ilocos Norte, Pangasinan, Ilocos Sur, and La Union. We do have also international viewers from Hong Kong, India, and Pakistan. Thank you very much for staying with us to this uh, last session for today. Okay, so um, 
as of now, we have 11 likers, 11,000 likers in our FB page and 4,000 followers in our YouTube channel. Okay, so uh, continue following us and subscribing to our YouTube channels. We prepared a lot of webinars for you for this month. Okay, so uh, I guess our speaker is already uh, ready. Oh, not uh, okay. So, uh, for your e certificates, I would like to inform our participants that we will be giving e certificates to you after the talk of our speaker this afternoon. We will be giving you the link after his talk. Okay, and uh, the presentations of our speakers. Uh, are recorded, you can replay this their presentation after their sessions. Okay, so you can access those uh, presentations, recorded presentations in our Facebook page and in our YouTube channel. Okay, so I guess our speaker is already uh, ready. So uh, please allow me to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is a graduate of Doctor of Medicine at the University of Perpetual Health System, Laguna. He is also a graduate of Master in Public Health at Children's Medical Center, Philippines Institute of Community and Family Health, Incorporated. He also completed the advanced course on LEAD PH at UE Institute for Studies in Diabetes Foundation. He worked as a former dean of the University of Northern Philippines College of Medicine and College of Health Sciences. She, he also served as a resident trainee in internal medicine at Ilocos Training and Regional Medical Center. He is a diplomat at, at the Philippine College of Physicians and a practicing internist in the provinces of Ilocos Sur, Abra, and La Union. At present, he is the chairman of the Patient Safety Committee of the Locus Training and Regional Medical Center, City of San Fernando, La Union, Assistant Research Chair for Representation and Linkages of ITRMC, and Medical Officer 4 of the said institution. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Joel Beleno to discuss to us the vulnerability of the elderly in higher education institution in COVID-19. Hello, Doc. Hi, hello. Good afternoon, Mel. Good afternoon. Hello. How are you? Hello, I'm okay, Mel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doc. All right, okay. Are, are my slides being shared now? Uh, not yet, Doc. Pero nakikita uh, niyo It's loading, no? Ito po siyang ano, na ilalabas na PowerPoint doc. Okay, so while waiting for our speaker to set up uh, her presentation. Mel, is it? Yeah, do, do, do you see my slides already? Uh, I guess we have a problem in your internet connection. Yeah, we have a technical difficulty. Uh, Mel. Yes, po. We'll transfer to another uh, monitor. Okay. Okay, since uh, we have a uh, technical problem, uh, again, I, we would like to... Uh, uh, express our deepest gratitude to all our participants from the different provinces, from the different regions in the Philippines, and also our international uh, uh, audience from Hong Kong, India, and Pakistan. Thank you very much for staying with us. Again, for your e-certificates, we will be uh, giving you the uh, link where you will going to uh, accomplish your feedback, feedback forms, and also your short quiz okay we will be giving you the mechanics on how you will going to accomplish your food feedback forms and the quiz after our last last speaker okay so uh, thank you very much to all our uh, 11,000 likers in our Facebook page and in our uh, YouTube channel we have 4,000 
followers. Okay, so uh, uh, next Thursday, we also have another uh, webinar. Uh, we will be focusing on uh, PWD students with uh, disabilities. We, we invited uh, the chairperson of special needs and inclusive education uh, from, of Miriam Colleges. Uh, she will be uh, discussing to us individualized and differentiated instruction for PWDs during the COVID-19. We'll, and in the afternoon, we also uh, invited a specialist uh, on online learning modalities. Uh, he will going to uh, talk about portfolio making. Okay, so those are the different um, topics that we will be discussing uh, this uh, Thursday. Okay, so... Uh, what else? We also uh, prepared um, sessions, executive courses to all our institutions. This is in uh, in coordination with the Office of Program and Standards Development. This is executive course for uh, online learning models. I guess our speaker is already ready. Uh, Hello, hello, Doc. Yeah. Yes. All right. So uh, we can already see your presentation. May I request right. you right. to uh, we'll start? To, uh, right. Sorry about the technical difficulty on, uh, from our end. It's All okay, right. Doc. Can I now, Mel? Yes, we can uh, already see your presentation, Doc. But we'll start presenting po your slides so that it will uh, be the presentation. Po. All right. Okay, Mel. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the Commission on Higher Education Region One for inviting me as one of the speakers in your webinar series in this period of challenging times in the health sector and affecting everyone. This afternoon, I will discuss with you one very important topic that hits home, that is the elderly's vulnerability to COVID-19. I don't have any disclosures to make, and this is the outline of today's presentation. Let me walk through the current situation of our country and our region regarding COVID-19, but before I do that, Allow me to give you an overview about the virus itself. Coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, was first identified in Wuhan, in the province of Hubei, China, in December 2019. It is also called SARS-CoV-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And this is the virus that causes the disease known as COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh coronavirus that has affected humans. HKU1, NL63, OC43, and 229E are the less popular ones which cause mild respiratory symptoms. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the cluster of viruses which cause severe respiratory disease alongside the first SARS-CoV and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus virus, or MERS-CoV. Studies in China have initially been documented COVID-19 to present with the following symptoms. 83 to almost 99% of the cases presented with fever. Cough was seen in about 59 to 82% of the cases. In 31 to 55, 55% Patients complained of shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing. Other nonspecific symptoms commonly noted include myalgia, headache, fatigue, and have, some had diarrhea. As of June 8, 2020 at 6 p.m., the World Health Organization reports in its COVID-91 dashboard 136,405,000 new cases 136 rather, 136,405 new cases, bringing the global total cases record to 
931,000 with number of deaths reaching 400,857. The Philippines, as of June 2020, recorded a total of 21,340 cases with 15,905 considered as active cases. Out of these numbers, there were deaths recorded at 994, out of which seven new ones were noted. As of the mentioned date, there were recoveries at a total of 4,441, with 111 reported as new. Region 1, or the Ilocos region, as of June 7, 2020, had 74 total cases of COVID-19, with the province of Pangasinan recording the most number of cases. As of the said date, there are 32 active cases. The region reported a total number of 12 deaths, and there was one new death reported as of June 7, 2020. Out of 74 total cases, recoveries were noted at 30. From the current 32 cases in the region, 31 of these have mild symptoms, while there is one asymptomatic. Because of the increased number of tests done brought about by the growing number of molecular laboratory facilities in the country, including the number of people being tested, we notice the number of cases to be increasing. Although what is comforting to know is that the number of deaths have significantly decreased over the past several weeks. 95.5% of the cases being seen are mild, with only 0.34% labeled as severe and 0.11% that is 19 out of the 16,362. Asymptomatic persons who tested positive for COVID-19 is 4%, that is about 660 out of 16,362. As per age distribution of COVID-19 in the country, the age group 60 to 69 years recorded the most number of cases, followed by those belonging to the 50 to 59 years old. Individuals at 30 to 49 years old almost had the same numbers with respect to incidence or occurrence of cases. As to the number of deaths, most of these come from those 70 years old and above, followed by adults at 60 to 69 years old and those at 50 to 59 years bracket. So the elderly indeed suffered the most number of deaths due to COVID-19. Looking at the national data with respect to the number of daily deaths recorded due to COVID-19, it is indeed comforting to note that a significant downtrend within the past few weeks often seen at less than 10 nation uh, less than 10 nationwide i was requested by one of your hei supervisors to discuss a particular group's vulner vulnerability to covid-19 particularly those with diabetes and hypertension as we note an increasing number of these cases among not only ched among not only among ched employees but nationwide as well I don't have a local data on the prevalence of diabetes among the elderly in the region. What we have at hand is national prevalence data of diabetes in the adult population in the country. Anyway, from an adult total population of 63,265,700, diabetes is seen among 3,993,300 or 6.3% of the total adult Filipino population. Hello, Mel? Hello? Yes, Doc. Hello, Do you, can you still see the slides? Uh, we can see the slides, Doc, but it's not full screen. May I request you for to uh, start uh, the slide presentation for? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, shall I start from the beginning? No, it's not necessarily, Doc. Uh, ja we were able to record naman po yung uh, uh, backgrounding nyo po kanina. Okay, so where will I restart? Uh, I guess you just click the play button there. Play. Or the All right. slide. 
Okay. Is this okay now? Doc, it's still the same. Uh, you go back to your PowerPoint presentation and then you start slideshow. All right. Slideshow. Play. All right. Uh -huh. It's not yet coming. It's not yet full screen, Doc. Oh, full screen. Oh, it should be full screen. Yes, Bob. Okay. I guess that's much better, Doc. All right. So we'll continue with this slide then. Yes, please. Okay, can we go back to the previous slide? Okay. All right. Is this okay now, Mel? Yes, Doc. That is okay already, Bob. All right. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty. Anyway, deaths due to complications of diabetes are noted to commonly occur among the 60 to 69 years old followed by those um, followed by those 70 years old and above. A significant number of deaths followed among those at 50 to 59 year old range. If we look at the comorbidities or occurrence of other diseases on these cases of COVID-19, we note that 21% and about 10% have hypertension and diabetes, respectively. Other diseases noted to coexist with COVID-19 include those with cardiovascular and respiratory problems. Recently at the hospital, we see increasing number of cases with chronic kidney disease, although these also have hypertension or diabetes as primary causes of a chronic kidney disease. A systematic review and meta-analysis on the prevalence of comorbidities among patients with COVID-19 concluded that underlying systemic diseases like hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and respiratory diseases are seen as risk factors for those with severe disease compared to those with non-severe condition. Before discussing diabetes in COVID-19 patients, let me walk you through a study done in China regarding the noted number of deaths among patients with hypertension. In this study, it was found out that close to 40% of the total number of deaths had hypertension. Of this, 81% were more than 60 years old. Hypertension being a proxy for other cardiovascular risk factors like diabetes, hypertension-mediated target organ damage, cardiovascular complications is seen at increasing prevalence with age. Hence, the reported association of COVID-19 with hypertension is confounded by age and comorbidities. The next few slides may sound too technical for our audience now, but I deem it very important for you to know that these are related to an understanding of the occurrence of cases and even deaths due to COVID-19 among these groups of the elderly population. So bear with me on this. In COVID-19 patients, a lot of researchers have shown the occurrence of what we call a cytokine storm, especially among those who had severe or critical condition. We note a rapid deterioration of patients as pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 which are noted to be closely associated among patients with hypertension and diabetes, as we will see later, with poor clinical outcomes. Further, researchers have shown that other markers like CD4+, and CD8+, are seen to be dysregulated among those with hypertension, combined with an overproduction of various pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly interleukin-17, 7, and 6, as well as gamma interferon and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Interestingly, studies have shown that among COVID-19 patients who succumbed to poor clinical outcomes, there was an indication of immunosenescence, meaning the immune system of, immune system of the individual has become senescent as aging proceeds, 
when compared to the immune system of younger individuals. Expectedly, the antiviral defense of these population groups become less efficient on top of cytokine overproduction. The end result of these factors mentioned is accelerated target or end organ damage. Hence, this data altogether factored in among an aging population explains why hypertension is potentially associated with COVID-19 with a more severe course. Now, let us proceed to diabetes and the risk of COVID-19. To date, according to the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, there is yet paucity of data to support the apparent link of diabetes with COVID-19 risk. However, based on studies mostly done in China and eventually in Italy and in the United States as well as Europe, where the, where the virus initially wrecked havoc on, researchers have seen mechanisms of association. Part of these mechanisms were already presented earlier in the discussion of hypertension. Elevated plasmin levels in imbalance between angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and cytokines, reduced viral clearance and increased pro inflammatory markers. These are the recurring mechanisms seen among patients with COVID 19, part particularly those with diabetes. Again, I ask your indulgence as you see some technical jargons in the next few slides. I will try to have this translated to the most laymanized manner as much as I can to foster better understanding. COVID-19 patients with, di with diabetes were noted to have elevated plasmin levels. Plasmin or plasminogen is an important component of the blood coagulation or fibrinolytic system of the body. When blood levels of plasmin is seen to be elevated, blood platelets become decreased. I will not delve on the very specific mechanisms as I don't think you would appreciate this. Anyway, with decreased blood platelets, there is an increased tendency for bleeding or hemorrhage. This mechanism also brings about hypertension and dehydration of fluid lining lung airways and alveolar cells. This slide talks about the imbalance of ACE2 and cytokines in patients with COVID-19. This is pretty close to the earlier slides which tackled cytokine storm in hypertensive individuals. This results to acute respiratory distress syndrome and lung injury in fulminant infections with SARS-CoV-2. Again, on top of this cytokine storm, given an individual with a senescent immune system, the risk of dying from COVID-19 among their, in, I mean, in their 60s and 70s is seen to be at 0.4 and 1.3% respectively. As the individual gets older in their 80s, the risk of dying is 3.6%. We remember earlier in the presentation that the risk of death is higher among elderly groups. The immune system becomes slower, less coordinated, and less efficient, which brings us now to viral clearance of COVID-19. With respect to the reduced viral load and clearance, studies have indicated that mild care represent about 90% of COVID-19 have lesser viral load and clears this faster than those who have higher or more severe or critical condition or I'm meaning they I mean they have a higher viral load and they have a slower uh, the virus gets cleared slower from their system studies have shown that COVID-19 tests tests remain positive among this uh, groups of uh, critical uh, patients 10 days after its onset Clinical manifestations of COVID-19 have a certain degree of peculiarity among the elderly. Although fever is still the most common symptom, fever response is blunted in older individuals, especially those who are frail, so that the temperature monitoring among this group should be at a lower threshold, meaning we need to adjust as to labeling them as febrile. Cough and shortness of breath may indicate decline in respiratory function as well as impaired mobility and falls or confused or they may also present as an exacerbation of heart failure or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD rather than a new complaint. Other considerations that need to be taken is that a lot of older adults have dementia 
and this would present unique challenges to us clinicians, including symptom assessment and isolation strategies. With these special considerations, we at the clinical settings need to have a low level of threshold for suspicion and testing for SARS-CoV-2. Effort should be exerted as much as possible to avoid bringing these elderly groups to the emergency room and to conduct testing and management in rapidly accessible area with low exposure to mitigate, spread, and avoid overwhelming the healthcare system. Going back to diabetes and COVID-19 risk, there is an accumulation of active innate immune cells in metabolic tissue, which leads to inflammatory mediators earlier mentioned and eventual systemic insulin resistance and beta cell damage in the pancreas. Patients with type 2 diabetes have an increased risk for complications with SARS-CoV-2 infection due to immune dysfunction. In turn, this viral infection leads to fluctuation in blood sugar levels, which adversely influence outcome of the disease. With the current pandemic, management of COVID-19 among patients with diabetes and hypertension pose challenges brought about by quarantine, shortage of medical resources, from testing to isolation, including availability of face masks and other PPEs, to the need of mechanical ventilators in the hospital, among others. Add to this the panic and anxiety, as well as insomnia, overeating, and lack of exercise. Other challenges include changes in dietary composition, with all those canned goods and noodles as part of the food assistance given by the government, and inability to access other food items, increased alcohol consumption, among others, including delayed visit to ER care. The Philippine Society for Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism has come up with a position statement regarding COVID-19 infection and diabetes. Of course, uh, foremost among this is hand washing, avoid touching face, particularly the mouth, eye, and nose. Second, of course, we have, we have always been hearing about staying home and physical distancing, taking meds regularly, maintaining a healthy and balanced diet, complement with proper exercise, monitoring of blood sugar regularly, and of course, getting in touch with your professional uh, healthcare provider. So that the next few slides will tackle about diet, lifestyle, and exercise in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. So what should be the diet for patients with diabetes? Uh, the diet for a diabetic person should include a proper and balanced diet, the general recommendations of which include eating enough vegetables, choosing lean meat, eat the right amount of fruits, choosing complex carbohydrates, drinking adequate amount of water, and control the amount of food. We'll go to each of uh, each um, in the next few slides. Regarding uh, eating enough vegetables, we need to wash them thoroughly before eating. Of course, we need to cook vegetables of, uh, rather than eating this raw salad. Allocate half of our plate for vegetables. We have to choose vegetables that do not wilt easily like uh, the okra and gourds. We need to choose lean and not fatty meat as source of our proteins so that we should be choosing fish and skinless chicken as source of protein. We need to choose lean portions of beef or pork and avoid fatty cuts. We have to limit egg intake to one per day. If possible, avoid canned goods and dried fish as this may contain a high amount of salt. Eating the right amount of fruits would entail um, eating one small piece of fruit uh, that is about less than a cup in amount every meal for breakfast, lunch, or, and dinner. And fresh fruits, fresh fruits are chosen because they contain sugar and they are an excellent source of vitamins and minerals. We have to choose the right kind of carbohydrates like um, uh, yams and sweet potatoes. Avoid sources of simple sugars like candies and sugar-sweetened beverages like soft drinks, milk tea, and juices. We need to drink adequate amount of water uh, elderly need to be advised to drink two liters of water a day to avoid dehydration. 
they should be advised to monitor color of their urine. A bright colored, a bright yellow colored urine means the patient is dehydrated and he has to drink more water. Avoid coffee, soft drinks, and juice if possible. Regarding the amount of food, in, food intake, we have always been hearing about the pinggang pinoy. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, advocated by the Department of Health, which is a nine-inch plate in which one plate would own, one plate only should be served for every meal. Uh, of this plate, we should allocate half portion of the plate for vegetables and fruits. That is the glow part. The go and grow parts would meaning allocating a quarter of the plate for carbohydrates and a quarter for proteins respectively and drink sufficient amounts of water. Now let's proceed to some home-based exercises for people with diabetes. A word of caution though, before an elderly patient, especially if he has diabetes or hypertension, needs to consult with his healthcare provider, the physician, regarding the allowable exercise that he should be involved, that he should be getting into. So that's really very important, consulting your healthcare professional. One of these would be the use of a treadmill. This would involve one hour brisk walking. There is really no need to run, which can be split into three 20 minute sessions. In a treadmill, the slope should be adapted to individual fitness levels to simulate an uphill walk. The elderly can also make use of stationary bicycle, reclined or classic. Uh, this would involve two 15-minute sessions at variable intensity if the equipment allows for it. Sessions on the stationary bicycle can be longer, 20 minutes or more, on a reclined bicycle since the effort is reduced by backrest. So these are just some of the squats and uh, sit-ups and crunches uh, exercises that uh, the elderly can uh, can do as part of their home exercises. However, again, there is a need to consult your healthcare professional before doing this. Bodyweight exercises like push-ups, squats, and deep stationary lunges, sit-ups or crunches would strengthen the abdomen. And the forward flexes, on the other hand, would strengthen lower back muscles. muscles. Uh, Bodyweight ex exercises also help maintain muscle tone and when performed correctly can have excellent results. Joint mobility and stretching exercises can be sourced from common workout, yoga, and Pilates routines. Uh, the elderly can uh, do uh, walk, can walk up and down eight sets of stairs for at least six floors. However, again, this is not recommended for people with type two diabetes who have not been exercising regularly. Another would be two series of 20 jumping jacks, uh, on-site jumps with synchronized leg and arm spreading and closing. Two series of 15 crunches to, up, to strengthen your abdominal muscles. Two series of 15 forward flexes to strengthen your lower back muscles. Two series of 10 rowing exercises using dumbbells and slight forward flexion to strengthen your back muscles. Exercising at home, makes it easier to manage stress as well as symptoms of diabetes. Doing a regular exercise can also increase insulin sensitivity. Exercise increases ability of muscles to store and use sugar for energy, which has a stabilizing effect on blood sugar levels. Very important during this pandemic is to have a right set of mind or mindfulness. We elderly adults need to be taught on how to breathe and be mindful. Doing breathing exercises are a highly effective way of improving mental health and minimizing anxiety. Aside from helping them become more mindful in general, these easy to learn exercises come with a number of benefits like they help you relax and focus more. Uh, they are proven to help reduce stress levels. They increase control of emotions and helps the elderly be, uh, get a better sleep at night. Proper breathing or the belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing, so-called, strengthens the diaphragm. A uh, half cough technique can also be advised for those with chronic lung diseases, pulmonary fibrosis, and avoid fatigue. Forced coughing technique can also be ad advised. First lip breathing, particularly those with uh, lung problems, 
uh, would involve opening the airways to ease breathing, relieving shortness of breath, and promoting relaxation. So again, the belly breathing is done in this way. Uh, the, while, while the patient inhales, belly should be, should be out. And as the patient exhales, belly should be in. This belly breathing would improve respiratory function by relaxing tight chest muscles and by increasing lung capacity. This is especially helpful for patients with COPD. Feeling anxious can, for some people, uh, can to some people be worsened by isolation. So that it is during this pandemic, it is very important to connect with friends, family, and colleagues online. Put your phone to use, turn on your webcam, and send messages to check up on friends and family. I guess uh, your previous speaker has uh, tackled uh, more measures on coping up. I guess that's my last slide. In summary, our, uh, I have given you an overview of the current COVID-19 situation in the country, including our regional data. I've also given you uh, a brief description of the coronavirus causing COVID-19 disease, as well as its presenting symptoms. COVID-19 risk among elderly, particularly those with hypertension and diabetes, um, have also been discussed. I mean, the association of COVID-19 risk with hypertension and diabetes population. And I've also presented some uh, uh, challenges uh, that has involved in the management, uh, in managing this elderly diabetes, in elderly population during pandemic, which has included diet, exercise, and coping. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc. Yes, Mel. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, po. Uh, so uh, before we uh, proceed to our open forum, Doc, uh, we would like to again acknowledge our participants who are uh, with us this afternoon uh, to uh, listen to your uh, discussion regarding the vulnerability of elderly to COVID-19. That is really a very comprehensive discussion on COVID-19 and the correlation of this particular disease to hypertension and diabetes, which is a common uh, diseases of uh, elders. Okay, yes. so uh, uh, are we ready for the first question? Go ahead, Mel. Okay, uh, our first question, Doc, this is from uh, Mr. Silverio Farida. Uh, good day, Doc. What exercise can you recommend for individuals who have undergone uh, TABISU? Thank you, Po, and stay safe. Sorry okay. for that uh, question, Doc. Oh, by the way, TABISU is uh, an operation that has involved removing uh, the, um, the ovaries and the uterus. Yes. Well yes. It's actually a, a, a surgical procedure that is a... Uh, uh, that for women, I mean, it's, it's, it's a surgical operation done by, by actually the exercise, the, there's no particular exercise that is recommended for TAPISO. Of course, you need to clear up with your, uh, with your obstetrician and gynecologist as well as your cardiologist on what particular exercise can be, can be uh, resorted to, resorted to. However, the, men, the exercises that I are, that are mentioned earlier can be done. Any of those uh, would be, would be good. But just get um, a very, I mean, you need to get a clearance from your cardio uh, aside from your OB before doing so. So practically all those ex exercises that we have mentioned can be done by a patient uh, post so. But you just need to consider the time when you are, uh, when that particular patient is allowed to do so. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. Another question, this is from Tian Shi Lowen. How can you differentiate asthmatic individuals and patients with COVID? Uh, actually, um, uh, the asthmatic individuals can also be uh, a group of individuals that can have an increased risk of COVID-19. But re regarding your question on like how do you differentiate asthma, actually asthma involves um, uh, bronchoconstr bron bronchoconstriction or uh, the narrowing of your airways. However, uh, in COVID-19, the, the pathophysiology that doesn't involve actually uh, constricting the airways, rather the, the mechanisms involved are the ones that I mentioned earlier, like the cytokine storm, um, overproduction of um, pro-inflammatory mediators, which are not really found in cases of asthma. But uh, I'm not saying that asthma patients could not be 
uh, I mean, asthma patients can also be at risk of doing uh, of uh, having COVID nineteen. But the pathophysiology are a lot different. Okay, thank you, Doc. Another question. This is from uh, Mr. Camelo Obiar. Uh, would you recommend outdoor biking for fifty year old and above, Doc? Uh, in this time of uh, the general generalist uh, in Metro Manila, general community quality, and most of the provinces already uh, in modified GCQ. Of course, yes, they can do already um, biking. However, again, as I mentioned earlier, there has to be clearance. Uh, from your uh, healthcare provider, especially so if this patient has diabetes, cardiac problem. But generally, a 50-year-old individual can, of course, do uh, outdoor biking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Uh, another question we have uh, here. This is from Mr. Al Cameron Avila. There are many alternative techniques that uh, abound the social media regarding COVID-19 medication. One of which is your is steaming suob. Is this advisable for elderly? Uh, actually, uh, I uh, I have. Uh, let me just give you uh, like um, one of my relatives has even uh, asked me about this soap thing, which uh, actually this uh, practice among among elderly uh, in the provinces. Uh, as to date, as uh, as of this uh, time. There has been no report as to the efficacy or effectiveness of this particular practice with regards to preventing the the, the COVID nineteen. There no there's no literature or evidence that uh, support this. Okay, thank you, Doc. Uh, another question. This is from Miss uh, Fatima Carzola. Uh, how about those who have age related bronchitis? Are they uh, vulnerable as the patients with diabetes and hypertension? Yes, as I have mentioned in my uh, slides earlier, which has tackled the comorbidities, meaning the coexistence of diseases along with COVID-19, you have noticed that one part of that pie are patients presenting with respiratory, respiratory diseases. And bronchitis, age-related for that matter, can also be a, 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 a comorbidity. It can coexist. Thank you, Doc. Uh, we have here another question from Mr. Ms. Charlotte. Kanilang, uh, what vitamins and food supplements would you recommend for senior citizens, especially for those who continue to work even at their age? Yeah, thank you for that question. Actually, uh, 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 there is no uh, current evidence that has been uh, that has uh, been. I mean, that has that has been said to be supportive of these statements, like these so and so vitamins are effective in controlling or preventing COVID nineteen. However, there are anecdotal reports uh, that uh, some patients given vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A. Um, but again, these are just anecdotal reports. Uh, they are not, well, if, it, if you have them, you can take them. But uh, there is no hard evidence pointing to, to like um, these vitamins can prevent COVID-19. There is no such thing. No current evidence as of yet. Thank you, Doc. Uh, another question by uh, from um, Teresa Surias. So, Suarez, rather. Uh, good afternoon, Doc. Since we are now in GCQ, most of the offices are in skeleton force. Would you recommend uh, an individual to report on work if he or she has an asthma? Uh, we do have a lot of patients having asthma. They they do report to work. It really depends on what um, what what type or i mean what stage of asthma that person has because uh, there is there is a gradation of asthma anyway and as long as the patient is on medication the symptoms are in control uh well they can they can still do their uh, work at the office however if they have a acute attack of asthma definitely they should not go to work yes so thank you but doc as, uh, asthma is stable and they are on medication they can report to work yes Thank you, Doc. Uh, another question from Mr. Tito Rocaberte. Uh, observations show that most elderly are sensitive, uh, assertive, demanding, and at times hard-headed. Uh, we know that they are battling against the feeling of helplessness and uselessness. How are we to deal with uh, such kind of elderly, Doc? Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, that's just like what I mentioned earlier, um, coping mechanisms like uh, being mindful, Doing some exercises, uh, I can. Uh, this can be sort of, This this can really be adapted by the by the elderly who are really aggressive. I mean, 
I would really want to go out. I think uh, uh, the the your your previous speaker is in a better position, can have more answers to that regarding coping mechanisms. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, another question we have here. Uh, huh. Okay, this one, Doc. This is from Ms. Uh, Jovi Espineda Villanueva. Uh, what will you suggest to HEI's uh, administrators and members of Skeletal Force who are senior citizens? Yes. Um, as far as I know, uh, regarding the, the, the directives issued by the National Interagency Task Force for Emerging Diseases, uh, they have actually made some um, special considerations for individuals uh, more than 60 years old uh, not, to, not to report physically at work. However, I think they can do work at home. Uh, it would really depend on the... However, this 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 uh, directed from the national IATF should be uh, should also be concurred with the agency concern. But yes, of course, uh, we do like in, in in other hospitals that I know they haven't required they they, they did not require actually their senior citizens sixty years old and above to be physically present at their work. So they okay. can do some office work at home. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, we'll be uh, down to the, our last two questions. Uh, we have here from uh, Mr. R. Yell. Is, is it true that wearing a face mask can actually harm the lungs' uh, circulation of air, Doc? Uh, as of the moment, uh, there is no evidence pointing to that. Uh, so that wearing a surgical face mask, wearing a surgical face mask at least is still recommended by the WHO. On that, uh, we haven't uh, seen a report on that yet. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. Uh, last question. Uh, I will be this. I will be picking this question from Mr. Uh, Shakni Benny. How long do elders uh, need to exercise every day? Does it means exercising can lessen the tendency to get COVID? Uh, the exercise, the duration of exercise, of course. Doesn't I mean doesn't lessen any tendency to get COVID nineteen? The exercises that I've mentioned a while back uh, would be part of your uh, like uh, uh, strengthening or enhancing your individuality while you are uh, in a quarantine. But this this is not in any way lessen your tendency to get COVID nineteen. Okay, so thank you so much, Doc, for the time and effort uh, for. Uh, accepting our invitation uh, to this uh, particular webinar series that we are doing at the Commission on Higher Education Region 1. Regards to all our colleagues there at Ilocos Training and Regional Medical Center. And um, stay safe, Doc. And, yeah. and uh, we would like to uh, ask you uh, for your concluding statement, Doc. Yeah. Um, uh, regarding conclude, I, I think you have heard this uh, a lot of times already. So. If there's really no uh, very important thing to do outside, better s still stay at home. The COVID-19 is still very much around uh, so that we need to continue physical distancing. We need to do hand washing very frequently. Um, keep, yourself, um, uh, keep yourself being mindful of the events uh, going around. Be mindful to exercise, eat a balanced uh, and healthy diet. Um, it's general, so we need to uh, continue being on the alert because we still do not have vaccine for COVID-19. So it's it's better to be uh, to continue uh, being safe uh, all the time. Thank you so much, Doc. Okay, so uh, that's the end uh, of our uh, second uh, speak. Uh, talk of our uh, speaker. Uh, in behalf of our uh, regional director, Dr. Rogelio T. Galera, and our two chiefs, uh, Mr. Uh, Danilo B. Bosse and uh, Ms. Nympha Benio, we would like to express our gratitude to, to you, sir, to you, Doc, uh, and also to the uh, ITRMC family, also to, the, to our uh, medical center chief. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, for you to share uh, all about uh, COVID-19 and its vulnerability to elderly. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyos. Uh, maraming maraming salamat po sa buong uh, bumubuo po ng uh, ITRMC. Welcome. Stay safe, Doc. Bye. Thank you po.
Okay. So uh, to all our uh, participants, uh, we would like to uh, remind you that in order for you to accomplish, in order for you to get your e-certificates, we would like you to accomplish uh, the feedback form uh, and the short quiz, which you can be access, which you can access in this particular link, uh, https colon slash double slash beat dot ly slash ched s2 session 2. Again, I would like to repeat the link where you can accomplish your feedback form and short quiz for you to be able to receive your e-certificates. Please accomplish it at https colon double slash beat dot ly slash ched s2 session 2. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, end of our uh, webinar series for this day. Again, uh, just to wrap up uh, this particular uh, uh, topics that we have had uh, this uh, particular day, we were able to uh, listen to our uh, uh, speaker from St. Louis University regarding the different uh, coping mechanism strategies that we can use uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also we were able to listen uh, the different best practices of Xijiang University on how they address the COVID-19 pandemic in the education sector. And earlier this afternoon, uh, we were able to listen uh, Honorable Geraldine Ruman for his uh, lecture on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression as part of our celebration in the LGBT month or the Prize Month. And uh, of course, uh, our uh, last topic is on vulnerability of elderly in higher education institutions to COVID-19, which was shared to us, delivered to us by Dr. Joel B. Bellano from the Ilocos Training and Regional Medical Center. So uh, once again, thank you very much to all our live viewers who stayed with us, uh, stayed with us, and also uh, to all our followers and subscribers in our YouTube channel and in our Facebook page. So uh, muli po, uh, see you next Thursday. We still have two more topics uh, for Thursday that is on PWD and on uh, portfolio making. So uh, maraming maraming salamat. Do not forget to accomplish the uh, feedback form and uh, the short quiz. Uh, you, the link can be found in your, uh, at the bottom part of your screen, it is flashed there. So just go there and answer the feedback form so, so that we'll be able to give you your e-certificates. The recorded, um, what do you call it? Recorded presentation of our, uh, our speakers, you can replay them after we end this session. Okay, so muli po, maraming maraming salamat uh, for staying with us, for watching our uh, webinar series for this day. See you next Thursday.
Thank you. 